into the service proper. I was going down the hall a while ago and I met a young man who was carrying this great big thing in his hand and I said, Jared, what's that? He said, well, let me, uh, let, let, I'll let him explain it to you. All right, Jared. Jared, Jared, Jared is, um, are you the captain or what are you, are, Jared? I just, but he's on, he's on the church softball team. He wanted to bring this in here and put it up front and bow down before it like Moses <laughs> did before the, before the golden calf. But what is it, Jared? It's the uh, first place regular season trophy for the softball league. Hold it up, hold it up. And <laughs> <laughs> all right, now, who, uh, I want all the team members to stand, the ones who are here this morning stand. Some of them in the balcony, some of them, there they are, Chris and Jimmy and uh, Kent and uh, Mitch and uh, Craig and all right. But they hold it up so they can see it, Karen. There it is, they won it again. For Now, I'm not going to let him bow down and worship it, but I told him he could put it up here so you can see it now at the end of the service. All right, we're going to sing again. Now, we're going to try this. We, last Sunday, we had some music there that uh, we added to it or whatever. But this little light of mine, you should know it by now. All right, let's stand, and Pat's going to lead us in it as we sing it this morning. Somebody give me the next verse. Let it shine till Jesus comes. That's a good one. All right. this morning, please. all right remain standing please and we'll sing our opening hymn my hope is built on nothing less than what jesus blood and righteousness we sing it together Stand.
Thank you, and you may be seated. It's my privilege, as always, to welcome you and to thank you for being here in, as part of our service this morning. If you're visiting, we extend a special word of welcome and greeting, and thank you, of course, for being here. By way of announcement, let me remind you that on Wednesday night we have our praise and prayer time, and we invite you to be a part of that. We will continue our Lighthouse Project next Sunday. Anafia Can Cam will be here. She's a lady from Africa who came here to study at uh, RCC and is now a registered nurse working on her nurse practitioner. She's a mother of four married to a husband who is a teacher, she will be coming back to Warsaw. They now live in Manassas? Uh, yes, up, up that way in Northern Virginia. All right. Rejoicing with those who have reason to rejoice. I'm going to start on birthdays over here. Yes, Jane. Rusty Brown has a birthday tomorrow. You joined Social Security yet, Rusty? <laughs> Have you tried it? <laughs> All right. Ronnie has one today. 6 0. All right. Any others? Any is over here? Richard, you're raising your hand or scratching your head? All right. Charlotte. How many was Mr. Joy? How many of the babies spoke up? 67? I got another hand. Who, who was it? Oh, Donald Douglas. What about it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Any on the balcony? Any anniversaries anywhere? No anniversaries? come to our prayer time mindful of those who have special needs this morning. Uh, you've seen Kent Sanders walking around here with a big patch on his fist. Kent uh, had an encounter with, uh, what you call that thing, uh, backhoe this past week and lost a finger and uh, is surviving that. Kent, you're doing okay. Doing all right. No dishwashing or anything for three months? <laughs> All right. There are others, I'm sure. Let us keep them in mind as we bow in prayer together. Father, this is a good day. The Bible says this is the day that you've made, and we are here to rejoice in it. We thank you for your presence with us and the promise of your blessings upon us. We remember those who have special needs today. They're listed on our prayer list, a lengthy list indeed. Some with needs greater than others, but all with needs. We pray that you will be, be with us as a church, that you will be with us in this country with all of the unrest and the difficulties that are going on, and that you will make yourself known in a special way in so many different ways. We pray for our church, our sister churches, those that are having homecoming revivals and so forth, and that you will be very present in all of those situations. Again, we thank you for the privilege that is ours to worship here today and pray that we'll know your presence in a very, very special way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Sharon and David Mann are frequent visitors uh, with us. And Sharon has ministered with us in music before, and she is going to do so again this morning. Sharon is going to sing at this time. Let me see what you're going to sing. What you're going to sing? Home of Hope and Hope. 
There's room, there's hope, there's time. All right. And David is helping her, but it's a different David. It's her uh, co-worker at RCC. There's still room at the cross for another heavy burden to be left by a weary passerby. There's still hope for your cause, for a loving God is waiting to restore to you the joy you felt inside. There's still time to decide that the Father really loves you and it's true. He'll never leave your side. No matter what you've heard, you can believe his word. There's still room, there's still hope, there's still time. God's word has been revealed for all to hear. Jesus loves you, he cares. So when the storms of life are drawing near, he, your heartache, will share. There's still room at the cross for another heavy burden to be left by a weary passerby. There's still hope for your cause, for a loving God is waiting to restore to you the joy you felt inside. There's still time to decide that the Father really loves you and it's true. He'll never leave your side. No matter what you've heard, you can believe his word. There's still room, there's still hope, there's still time. may wonder if the Lord is looking on. Can he comfort my heart? There's room for your burden at the cross. Lay it down where you are. There's still room at the cross for another heavy burden to be left by a weary passerby. There's still hope for your cause, for a loving God is waiting to restore to you the joy you felt inside. There's still time to decide that the Father really loves you and it's true. He'll never leave your side. No matter what you've heard, you can believe Word. There's still room, there's still hope, there's still time. No matter what you've heard, you can believe his word. There's still room, there's still hope, there's still time. There's still time. Thank you, Sharon. We will stand to sing together our offertory hymn, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Let's stand, let's sing it together.
ways of expressing that love, and one is through our faithful giving. Mike will lead us in our prayer as we share this morning. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this church family that we can gather together in the freedoms that are provided by our military, that we can praise you. We ask a special blessing upon the military and their families, bring them home safely. And for the first responders, we ask a special blessing on them also. As we give you our tithes and offerings, we ask that you multiply it and use it in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Did you know what our hymn was going to be before you put, you already knew? All right. Thank you. You may be seated. And Sharon will share with us another beautiful song, Amazing God. All right. I'd like to tell a little story about this first, about how the song became a song. The songwriter's mother was 87 years old, and she was told that she'd only have six months to live if she didn't have this open heart surgery. So she decided to have the surgery done. She made out fine, just came through amazingly. And the doctors even came to her and told her, you are an amazing woman. And she said, no, I serve an amazing God. to hear the story of how I made it through when life is full of trouble pain and fear the answer may sound simple though everything else crumbles one thing has remained through all the years I still serve an amazing God He's been with me every mile my weary feet have trod He still cares He still 
heals. He's still mending broken hearts and drying tears. This old world is bound to change, but I Amazing God, you're still amazing me. The God who parted waters still makes a way today. He's always brought me through the troubled seas. The one who fed the thousands, whose words could calm the tempest. He's my bread of life, and he's my peace. I still serve an amazing God. He's been with me every mile, my weary feet have tried. always amazes me how God puts things together. Uh, Sharon, did you know that Michael was the speaker for today? You knew. But uh, if you don't believe that God is an amazing God, you haven't heard this young man's story. In fact, this has never happened in my life, Rod. I've been preaching for longer than Methuselah. It's never happened. I invited uh, Michael, after I heard his story, to come to our church. He sent me a copy of his sermon to check out before he came. And I checked it out. And Michael, if you don't mind, we're going to go ahead and eat lunch while you talk, because I've already read your sermon. And so, But this man, come over here, Michael. This man was with us for another meeting back several months ago. And as soon as I heard him, I said, we've got to have him come to our church. Michael Lewis, his wife, go ahead and introduce them. Stand here close, Michael. 
Well, my wife Kimberly here in the front row and a one-year-old boy Patrick who's in the nursery, I guess. Uh, we're happy to be here this morning. We're glad to have you, Michael. It's all yours. Good morning. <laughs> the privilege to be here with you all this morning. As Pastor Bowen said, my name is Michael Lewis. I spoke here at Cobham Park back in May as part of an educational dinner on whole life activism. Matter of fact, Harry Beatley, who was with y'all last Sunday, uh, she was the one who invited me here to speak, and I'd never spoken to church before in my life. So now I'm wondering, what did you get me into, Terry? Well, Pastor Bowen called me about a week after I came back in May, invited me back. He said, will you come preach? I said, I've never preached in my life, but yeah. I'm humbled by his invitation, and I'll do my best. As you can tell, I have a disability. I have cerebral palsy, which affects my hearing, speech, and fine motor skills. My disability was not known before I was born. In fact, it is the result of medical malpractice. My parents never considered aborting me, of course, like so many do today with disabled children. But after I was born, my prognosis was grim. Matter of fact, I was baptized by a nurse in the hospital because they didn't think I'd make it through the night. Doctor told my parents that I'd never walk, talk, or do much of anything. Today, I'm standing here before you all. I'm a working professional, a husband, and a father to a one-month, one-year-old boy. See, when you be Become a parent, you completely lose track of time, don't you? <laughs> we live in a fallen world that replaced God with man. Our culture said that the imperfect, the elderly, the sick, the disabled, a social burden. Many advocate the elimination of such people through abortion, doctor assisted suicide, and the euthanasia. We live in a culture where many would say, I don't count. I shouldn't be here. But God had the purpose for all of us when he knit us together in our mother's womb. I am living proof that disabilities are not an accident, a burden, or as some have claimed, incompatible with human life. Individuals with disabilities are God's way of teaching us about the joys and fragility of human life. They enrich and change the lives of everyone for the better. A couple of days ago, I came across a quote by Thomas Jefferson. 
who one said the people always get the government they deserve. When I read this quote, I realized that we as a society created the mess that we live in. When we embraced moral relativism, when we began to remain silent, when we discovered that co-workers or siblings or neighbors were cheating on their spouses, contraception, fornicating, stealing, aborting, and all other manner of immoral deeds in order to avoid judging, we implicitly said as a society that we welcomed dishonest, immoral, narcissistic leaders. When we stopped upholding objective moral standards some 50 years ago, accepting the lie that, quote, it's not hurting anyone, when we bought into a culture of self instant gratification, and narcissism, we embarked on the road to our current state. So we really shouldn't be at all surprised when we have a bunch of cowards, liars, adulterers, and cheaters of all political stripes running for office. Our current situation stems from a long-standing revolution against the dignity of the human person. It's a revolution that has transformed our society to one that views individuals as creatures created in the image and likeness of God to one where in the highest social good is the self and sexual pleasure. Humans are now viewed merely as objects to our gratification. We see this manifested in a hypersexualized culture that has normalized the objectification of men, women, and children. We are both at the same time hypersexualized and sexless. We've made the feminine masculine and the masculine feminine. We are no longer viewing ourselves as creatures of God. In fact, society said that we can create ourselves. We are no longer male and female. We are whatever suits our fancy. Matter of fact, Facebook tells us that we can be 50 different genders. Now, when I think about that, I think about a group of 21-year-olds sitting around with the big case of alcohol, just throwing stuff out and seeing it was sick. The famed Boston College theologian, Dr. Peter Kraft, 
maintain the law descent from God's truth centered around one thing. S E X. No longer did society debate theological concepts related to ecumenism or trivial authority or even biblical interpretation. Now, most of our theological discussions are debates over morality. We have set God as, we have set man as God, believing that man can create a perfect society. But as St. Augustine warns us, all efforts to create the city of man as the pinnacle of human existence are futile and lead inevitably to chaos and destruction. All we have to do is ask the prophet Isaiah. The Jews worshipped everybody but God. And for that, God destroyed them. We are living in uncertain times, immorality swirls around us. It tempts us. The fallen nature of this world, the evils that come across our television screens when we watch the evening news, they make us wonder what exactly is the point of this life. When we see how our world has abandoned God, we are tempted to give in and accept defeat. We are tempted to look for our salvation not in God, but in earthly leaders. We look for comfort and healing, not in the unchanging, infallible truth of Christ, but in leaders who, just like the rest of us, are fallen creatures who are nothing without God. No president, no senator, no congressman, no county commissioner can bring the healing of God that our nation so desperately needs. About a year and a half ago, a good friend of mine related to me that he and his wife were having marital problems. They got married about seven years ago, and when they got married, they agreed that they weren't going to have any children. The wife had changed her mind and desperately wanted to start a family. My friend is a veteran of the Iraq War. He's a Bible-believing Christian, and he said to me, I just don't think it's responsible to bring children into the dangerous, evil world of us. And this conversation went on for months, back and forth, back and forth. And I said to him, Ted, I said, every 
Hey. Since the Garden of Eden had believed that all hope was lost. Fifty years ago, my parents were worried that the Russians were going to lob a bomb at us. Before that, it was World War II. Before that, World War I. Before that, the Civil War. Before that, the revolution. Every single age had this problem because this is the fallen world. And you know what my pastor always tells me when I get down on myself? He goes, nobody is perfect. The only place we're going to be perfect is when we go to heaven. I told him, I said, are you allowing God to work in your marriage? Are you allowing God to decide if you should have children? He said, well, no, you know. Well, I said, if you let go and let God, I said, all of your marital problems will start to go away. Keep in mind, this man's been married about five years longer than I have, and I was the one telling him, giving him marital advice. About a month ago, this Hubble welcomed the sun into the world. They're overcome with joy, and I can see it on his face. They know that they've been entrusted by God with a mission to be a witness of God's love to this new baby boy. I reminded him of the Bible verse. I said, train him up in the way he should go when he will never depart from it. I said, as long as you give your children the foundations of faith, sure, they may get older and make mistakes and make bad decisions, but Deep down inside, they're going to be a, a tugging because they're going to have the value that you've imparted to him. Nitpicking at its contents. And like the prodigal son, I feel to make stray from time to time, but if you read them with the right value, they'll always come back. While it may seem as if the social order is crumbling around us, now is not the time to give up or to cow in the face of adversity. In the second book of Timothy, verse 4, we read, Proclaim the word. Be persistent, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Convince, reprimand, encourage, so we were all patience and teaching. But the time will come where people, when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but following their own desires and insatiable curiosity, will accumulate teachers 
and we'll stop listening to the truth and we'll be diverted to myth. We're there, folks. But you be self-possessed in all circumstances. Put up with hardship. Perform the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. <coughs> we cannot continue to remain silent in the face of evil. A year ago, I became a father, and my life has been forever changed by fatherhood. I have a message for the men in the room today. The father will not be one without men. We need to be soldiers of God first, faithful husband second, and spiritual, biological, and most of all, physically and emotionally present fathers. We are called by God to be the spiritual head of our families. Therefore, it is a grave moral imperative that as the heads of our families, we are mindful of what images and messages we and our families are exposed to. We are charged with raising our children righteously. It is in a recommitment to truth that we will heal our nation. Not in the election of this or that particular candidate. Faith drives morals, and morals drive culture. Culture drive the nation. So I invite you to get involved. Get involved beyond Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Teach your children about the beauty of God's design for marriage and family. And Still in them a sense of God-given dignity. Let your children love your spouse. A model of the vo vocation and beauty of marriage. My father and my grandfather have always had a saying that stuck with me, and it goes like this. The greatest gift a father can give the children is faith and the mother. Put not your faith in flashy rhetoric or false promises of earthly leaders but in the eternal promises of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, and God bless you. What was the name of that song, Sharon? Amazing God. Amazing God.
Amazing God, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. They live in Richmond, and they drove down. In Richmond, in the city? Yes. But drove down to be here this morning. Now, aren't you glad you came? Amen. Amen. If all went well, and David Newsom and his crew did their job, this will be on DVD, and by tomorrow night, it will be on the church website, hopefully, and just back there with a the little one, but uh, she handles all of that. But Michael, thank you so much, my friend. Uh, do you have time, I mean, after the closing, to stand here and let the people come? Some of them say nice things sometimes, Michael, I mean, so. <laughs> but uh, we're glad you heard it. What's our hymn? What are we going to sing? Speak to my heart. Is our closing hymn? Hymn of commitment, response, invitation. I think God has spoken to our hearts, hasn't he? In a unique way. Let's stand, let's sing it together, please. God speaks in different ways through a song, through a testimony, through a friendship. But he speaks. That's not the problem. We got to have ears to hear what he wants to see, hear, and a heart to receive it. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Next Sunday, remember, Afia will be here with her story. And then on the fourth Sunday, Chris Williams will be here with their story. So it gets better as it goes along. And then the 1st of September, you'll have to drop off back down to me. And so, uh, in the meantime, come on here, Michael. Please, sir. And Mrs. Michael. And what is the youngster's name? Patrick. Patrick. And your wife's name? Kimberly. Kimberly and Patrick and Michael. How you doing, buddy? No, I don't want you to go home with me. <laughs> 
All right. They're going to remain here at the front. Let them know how much you appreciate their visit. Thank you, Father, for the time together, for Michael's witness, his testimony, for his apparent love for you. And we pray that we will receive with open hearts and do something about that which we've heard today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.